uh, Pastor John is uh, serving our church, our sister church in El Paso this morning. Uh, so he is out there at Cross of Grace Church in El Paso, uh, serving their church while their pastor is on sabbatical. So we can pray for him this morning. This morning, we're continuing our series in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me there and join me as we pray. Well, Father in heaven, we come before you this morning, grateful, Father, for your grace at work in our lives. Grateful, Father, for all the songs that we just sung, Father, are a result of your gospel grace at work in us. We can sing, Father, because we have been redeemed. We can sing, Father, because our sins have been forgiven. We can sing as those righteous in your sight because of Jesus' righteousness imputed to us by your grace. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the church. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together with the saints, Lord, our brethren, the family of God, to sing your praise, to encourage one another, to fellowship God, and to hear from your word. And so now, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would attend the preaching of your word with your spirit, God. Empower us, God, to hear, to listen, to hear you speaking to us, God. Transform us by your magnificent grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. Please read along with me. This is the word of the Lord. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Well, like many of you, one of my favorite traditions at the end of the year, I know it's June, we're halfway through, but I'm already thinking about the end of the year. One of our favorite traditions in our house is to watch Christmas movies. And we all know that the best Christmas movie out there is The Muppet's Christmas Carol. Amen? And there are several movie adaptations of Charles Dickens' classic work, but The Muppet's Christmas Carol is by far the best, objectively speaking. I know that we all agree on that. The main character, as you know, is Ebenezer Scrooge. He is the miserly owner of a London accounting office. In the story, Scrooge lives a self-focused, greedy life without, without a care for anyone but himself. The, th the three spirits in the story visit the stodgy bean counter in hopes of reversing Scrooge's greedy, cold-hearted approach to life. And as they do so, Scrooge is confronted with judgment. Scrooge is confronted uh, by the spirits, his eyes are opened for the first time to the effect that his greedy, self-focused life has had on the world around him, on those he lives in community with. And the climax of the movie is when Scrooge sees his tombstone. He's faced with his doom. He realizes that he has wasted his life, and then he falls into the grave. Do you remember what happens next? He wakes up. It's Christmas morning. He has not died. He has not faced judgment. He is not facing doom. He realizes that, that he has a second chance, that he sees all those people whose lives he has been contributing to their ruin. He sees that they're still alive. They're still there. Tiny Tim is still there. Now, what happened to him that morning? His entire attitude toward his money and his possessions was transformed. Why? Why? He's had an experience of grace. What was the experience? It was a second chance, which is not much of a grace, but it was grace. It was undeserved. It was looked, unlooked for. He thought he was dead. He thought everything was gone. He thought, this is it. I am doomed forever. And then all of a sudden, a second chance. And as a result, he looks at his money and his possessions in a totally different way. Now, now Scrooge, the miser, now he is filled with joy. Now Scrooge is giddily scheming to get rid of his money, joyfully thinking of creative ways to bless others, to shower others with gifts, and how their lives are going to be changed by these gifts. And he can't wait to do it. He's not, he's not thinking begrudgingly, okay, well, all right, well, I've got to do this because I've got to appease the spirits. I've got to do this. No, his whole countenance has changed, isn't it? 
Do you remember? Do you remember him going about and excitedly surprising all these different people? The new Scrooge has been changed by grace to the point that his attitude toward his money and his possessions are cha- has been changed and it's no longer his. The Bible says that if you've experienced God's grace, you too will have a revolutionary way, new way of thinking about your money and your possessions. Where you can really tell what you believe is how you spend your money. It tells you where your heart really is. If Scrooge had, that, had his attitude changed simply by getting a, ch- a second chance, how much more should our attitude be changed by the grace that we have received through Jesus Christ? Because Christ's grace is a better grace. Christ's grace is not simply a second chance. You know what the grace of Christ Jesus is? It's not a, it's not a chance to redeem yourself. It's not, it's not one more Christmas to be a good person. You better go out and show me that you deserve it. That's not the grace of Jesus Christ. The grace doesn't say, Look at me, I'm compassionate and generous, and if you live like me, then you'll be able to redeem yourself. That's, that's the grace that Scrooge experienced, and even that was enough to change his attitude. But Jesus Christ didn't come into this world simply to give us an example. He didn't come into this world saying, if you live like me, if you do the kinds of things that I do, if you love the way that I love, if you give the way that I give, then, then you can be counted righteous in the sight of God the Father. No. If Jesus came to give us a second chance as our model, and my hope is to live like Jesus and to love like Jesus and to give like Jesus, to sacrifice like Jesus, well, then I'm doomed too. We all are because nobody can do that. But he didn't come here saying this. Our Christmas carol is different, friends. Our Christmas carol is not a second chance It's not one more chance to be good. The the gospel of the grace according to the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ came and died to pay the penalty of our failures for all time. And if we receive him, if we receive him, then, then all of our, then our record, our record of sin and debt becomes a record of righteousness. God no longer looks at us as enemies, but as friends, as loved ones, as those he delights in. He says, don't you see you're doing will never get you there. You can never do enough. But I have done it all for you. I have done all your good deeds for you. I have lived the life that you could not live. I have died the perfect death that you deserve. I have put myself in your place and I took your sin upon myself to pay your penalty so that if you trust me, if you trust me, if you lay your doing down, trust wholly in me, then the Father, then the Father will welcome you. Then the Father looks on you with delight. Then he picks you up and smiles upon you as his beloved child. So lay it down this morning. Stand in him gloriously complete as the hymn sings. Friends, when we experience gospel grace, we are completely, radically changed. Lives affected by gospel grace result in gospel-driven priorities. That's our main point this morning. Lives affected by gospel grace result in in gospel-driven priorities. We no longer live for our own kingdom, but for God's kingdom. We no longer pursue uh, our own selfish pursuits, but we pursue unity within our new family. We become generous with what has been entrusted to us, and we zealously proclaim the glorious gospel so that others, too, might share in this glorious grace and have their lives likewise changed. Lives affected by gospel grace result in gospel-driven priorities. In this passage that we're looking at this morning, in Acts chapter 4, Luke gives us three priorities that shaped the early church. These things were countercultural for these first believers. Three things that they did, not because they were radical people, not because they're good people. This isn't an example to follow. To If you do, do these things, then you'll be a good Christian, and then the Father will delight in you. No, these are three things that the gospel does in you. Three things that as a result we become. The first priority that Luke draws our attention to is their gospel-driven unity. Look here in your text. It says here in verse 32 that they are of one heart and one soul. Luke, this describes a comprehensive unity. As John Wesley put it, their loves, their hopes, and their passions were joined together. What joined them was not simply a, a common affiliation to the church. It wasn't um, anything simple like that, but there was a spiritual unity, a unity of passionate commitment to a common gospel mission. 
Before Luke describes in depth this passage, this passage is a, it's the second summary, right? The second time that Luke describes their radical generosity. But, and that's what, that's what fills most of this passage. But before he gets there, he describes a radical gospel-driven unity. You see, the effect of gospel grace among the community of believers is unity in the church. But this side of, it, of eternity and glorification, it doesn't just come easy all the time. It takes work. We must strive for this kind of unity. We must dedicate ourselves to this, recognizing that our mission depends on this unity. One of the key ingredients for our unity is a common desire to obey and to please God. In the book of Philippians, Paul insists that the unity of heart and mind here was the norm for the Christian life. Specifically, he calls in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. It sounds familiar. Again, in, in uh, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, we're exhorted to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then in Romans 15, Paul closes his letter praying, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unity is a, is, a crucial, um, is a crucial priority for the church because it reflects a common gospel, a common God, a common gospel mission. Disunity in the church, on the other hand, disunity uh, shows the world around us that we're just as self-focused as everybody else. Disunity and division in the church shows them that they're, we're a fractured people and, and bears terrible witness to the gospel. A fractured and divided church isn't compelling to anyone. We want to live our lives together as a compelling community, a compelling witness to the gospel grace of Jesus Christ. In fact, an effective witness, as one writer says, an effective witness for the gospel demands a church in unity. Before we can testify to the redeeming and life-transforming power of the gospel, we must display his work by being of one heart and one mind. So how do we do this in a culture like ours? In our culture, um, you know, it would be hard to argue that it's not a mostly individualistic and self-contained, self-focused culture. So how do we do this in a culture like ours? By the, power, by the power of the gospel and prayer for the Spirit to work in our lives. This is the result of God's work in us. It's not simply a call to do more, but it's a, this is, this is what I'm making you into. This is what I'm transforming you into. So we pray for one another, we open our lives to one another, we love one another, we care for one another, we seek to serve one another, we pray with each other, we pray for one another, we care for one another, we meet together, uh, we meet together in homes throughout the week, we meet together in meetings like this one right here, where we come all together to sing together, to encourage each other, to build each other up. We reject the lies of the world and Satan that insist that these kinds of meetings aren't good or necessary. This is where the church needs to be countercultural. This, in a world that is so private and individualistic, close, com close Christian community like this, when you come into a meeting and you experience true biblical fellowship, where people are opening their lives to one another, humbling themselves, being transparent with one another, coming together, like I did with, uh, with the men of my small group yesterday morning, spending out, you know, a couple hours together, praying together, bearing our soul with one another. That, friends, shows gospel unity. That shows a compelling community. That shows a compelling witness to the world when we're not simply coming together with our own agenda, self-focused, and seeking to impress one another and demonstrate, puff out our chest, and show how amazing we each are. This is where the church needs to be countercultural. Closed Christian community may be one of the most important prophetic messages that we can give to this world. But again, walking in this kind of unity requires work. It requires striving. It requires working toward that. We will be confronted. <laughs> we have been confronted. We will be confronted with one another's weaknesses and one another's sins. You'll be confronted with my weaknesses, my sin, one another. And it's here that we're called to be patient, bearing with one another in love. It's here that we're called to, when we're tempted to be offended, we should respond by being kind and compassionate to one another, not to be offended, forgiving each other just as God and Christ forgave you. We renounce gossip and slander as the divisive and evil sins that they are. We strive for unity. We walk in the light with one another. While we cannot force others to walk in the light, we can walk in the light individually 
and be the example for others and demonstrate what gospel humility, what the Spirit of God does in our lives. When I can come into a meeting and not feel the need to be the best and, and you know, be the most impressive and have the right words to say you know, to impress others, but rather a heart to love and to serve and to demonstrate the unity of the Spirit born in us. Before our generosity or our evangelism, we mean much to the world. We must be a church that is driven, that, that, that's priority is gospel-shaped, gospel-driven unity. And we can do this when our lives are centered on the gospel. This leads to our second point, gospel-driven generosity. This is where the bulk of the text focuses this, this morning. Look again at the text with me. It says, no one said that any of the things belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Growing up with three siblings, three younger siblings, I can tell you that our house was anything but this. Maybe you can relate. I remember one time in particular coming home, walking into the house and seeing one of my younger siblings wearing my shirt. It wasn't even my favorite shirt, but it was mine. Did he know that? What could account for this injustice? Of course he knew that. Oblivious to everyone else in the house, I walked over to my mother and I said, Mom, does he realize that that's my shirt? Why is he wearing my shirt? It's mine. Does he know that? Is he going to give it back? Who died and made him me? For some reason, my mother looked at me with blank stare and was unmoved by the incredible injustice that, that was occurring right in front of her nose. But it was my shirt and I needed an answer and I needed it now. Now, before you start shouting Team Aaron or Team Thief Brother, I want to assure you that he did live to steal more clothes other days. And we still happily share family meals. In fact, we were together yesterday. And I still peek inside of his bag before he leaves my home just to make sure that there aren't further crimes being committed against my wardrobe. Well, in Acts 4, we read these words and we instinctively know that this isn't natural that no one said any of the things that belonged to him was his own, and they had everything in common. One of the ways that the church stood out in the culture then and now is their radically different perspective on money and possessions. They had a radically different perspective. Listen to this letter from one of the early Roman emperors named Julian, who was trying to stamp out Christianity. He was against Christianity. He did not like it, and he wanted to eradicate it from the world. In his disgust, he wrote to one of his friends, this is a famous letter in church history about why they were succeeding, why the Christians were succeeding, why he couldn't eradicate them, why he couldn't stamp them out. And this is what he says, their success lies in their charity to all. They take care not only of their own poor, but of ours as well. This was countercultural kind of generosity. This was countercultural kind of others oriented orientation. This is proof positive that one of the main ways that differentiated the Christians from everyone else was their attitude toward money. And it was one of the main things that gave them a success in a world that really looked at them as quite odd and strange. It was one of the things that gave them their power and befuddled the world and changed their attitude toward them. Now, the question that comes up immediately is, why were they so different? Did they just feel the, the need to be more generous? Did they just feel, okay, well, we're Christians. We, we should give and we should do this and we, we you know, shouldn't do this. No, they, were, they weren't motivated by guilt. They weren't motivated by compulsion. They were affected by gospel grace. They had a new attitude, a new mindset about money and possessions. Luke says, if you look with me in verse 33, he says, great grace was upon them all. They were so affected by gospel grace that they couldn't help but be generous like Scrooge and, and just share similar to Scrooge, not the same way as Scrooge, but, but gleefully, joyfully, open-handedly giving away. Christians, unlike every other religion out there, we have a grace-based religion. Every other religion in the world is a, is a religion of moral effort, doing better than other people, doing enough works to balance out your bad. Every other religion out there is a religion of moral effort, good works, but Christianity is a religion of grace. Christianity stands alone in this. Christians' attitude 
as a result, to where their money and possessions is categorically different than that of the rest of the world? Is your attitude toward your money and your possessions different than the rest of the world? As your neighbors look at you, as your coworkers look at you, as your family members look at you, do they think there's something different about the way that they think about their money and their possessions? Or do they look at them, do they look at us and see us pining after the same things that the world is pining after? Do they, do they look at us and see us working with the same desperate desire to climb that ladder of, uh, of worldly prestige, of, of buying enough toys and enough trinkets? The early disciples' radical generosity led to a radically deeper and countercultural community, which led to more outsiders coming in and being saved. This has an effect. It's not just on our own hearts. It has an effect on the world. Now, I think, I think we can all agree that the world would be a better place if we all had this mindset, right? If we all had this kind of open-mindedness, open-handedness about our money and our possessions. But how do you do that? How do you fuel this kind of perspective? How do we account for the radically different perspective that the Christians had on their money and their possessions then and today? Unless you experience this kind of grace, friends, you simply, like Team Aaron, shout, mine, and cry injustice any time that somebody infringes upon your stuff or claims or asks you for money. Everyone feels this. This is my money. And besides, I don't, there's not enough of it to go around. That's what we feel. But if you're a Christian, you have a completely different approach to money and possessions. If you're a Christian, you look and you say, it's not my money anyway. It's not mine. I don't look at it as mine. I don't feel as though it's mine. It's not mine. It's all the Lord's. It's all his. Grace, grace frees you from your possessions. It frees you from the bondage and the slavery that it is to be owned by the things that you think you own. Grace frees you from your possessions. Gospel grace gives you a new perspective, a new attitude, a new approach to money and possessions. We realize that it's not our money. It's not our stuff. God owns it all. Now, is this a call in this passage to forsake it all, to give everything away in order to be saved? Absolutely not. Is Luke here teaching, as some think, an early form of communism where they were all selling their property and, and, you know, and giving it to everyone you know, so nobody can belong, you know, own anything? No. Luke does not say that these believers sold everything that they had. His words can be taken rather, to mean rather that the owners sold some of the properties that they possessed and brought the prices of what they sold to the apostles. Nor does Luke say that all owners of lands and houses sold everything. According to chapter 12, later in this book, a believer named Mary still owned a house 10 years later. If all this is correct, then verse 34 that we read implies that there were wealthy Jews who owned several houses who came to faith in Jesus and used their property, used their money, used their possessions to advance the work of the gospel. So it's not a call to communism. It's not teaching that it's wrong to own things or even to be wealthy. The point is this. What is most important to you, ultimately? You see, without exception, always without exception, we give our money effortlessly to that which is our God. Think about that. We give our money without effort to that which is our God. If your life is submitted to Jesus, then you know the money isn't even yours in the first place. And so your desire is to live in such a way that pleases him, that honors him, that shows the world around us that we can be so counterculturally generous and give and serve others for the sake of advancing the gospel in a lost and dying world. We show that our trust isn't in our bank accounts. Our trust isn't in the things that we own. Our trust is in the God who provides it all. Our trust is in the God who enables our bodies to work, enables us to earn money. Our, God, our trust is in him. He provides for us all. He provides for the sparrows. He provides for the flowers. And you are worth so much more than anything else. Our trust is not in our things. On the other hand, if your salvation is your status, and your security is in this life, or if it's in entertainment and fine and comfortable living, then your money is going to flow effortlessly to those things. Where's your money going? What is your God? What is it that you ultimately worship and ultimately trust in? Your money, friends, reveals what's most important to you. It tells you where your hope really is, where your joy is really found, and where you're ultimately placing all of your hope. 
If the idea of giving away large portions of your money to charity and to the church and to alleviating suffering in the world, if that is hard for you to consider, then it reveals that there's something else going on in your heart that's worth evaluating. It's worth looking at that. It's worth saying, what is it that's ultimately most important to me? If the idea of putting a large portion of your money into a new home, into a new home sounds good, like a wise and smart investment, but giving large portions of your money to the church, to the mission work of the gospel, or to the poor is not a good idea, then it really just shows you where your heart really is, where you really think your joy and grace come from. Gospel grace frees you. It changes you. It radically transforms the way that we relate to money and possessions. Yesterday, while I was working on this sermon, I popped on ESPN to check on my Texas Rangers uh, to see if they were beating the Yankees. They did. They crushed them with our new pitcher. And in doing that, I noticed a little, I noticed a note about uh, the NFL. So Derek Carr uh, is the quarterback for the Oakland Raiders. And yesterday, he signed a historic contract. He signed the largest contract. He's now the highest paid football player in the history of the NFL. Derek Carr for the Oakland Raiders signed a $125 million contract for five years. $25 million a year. That's incredible to me. Now, afterwards, what's more incredible is one of the reporters asked him. He said, Derek, you are now the highest paid player in NFL history. What are you going to do next? What are you going to buy? Now, what do you think he said? What do you think that Derek Carr, professional quarterback of the NFL, said he's going to buy with his $125 million? Disneyland? I mean, he could probably buy Disneyland for $125 million. What would you do? What would you do if, you're, if you just got a letter from your boss and you found out you're getting a five-figure bonus? Not even millions of dollars, not even a six-figure bonus, but a five-figure bonus. Do you instinctively, this is what I asked my kids yesterday. I, I went to my kids, I showed them this video. It's like, this, this is remarkable. And I, and I stopped, I said, now kids, what would we do if, if daddy just found out you know, that my business just prospered and I just got a windfall of cash? What would we do with it? What would you do with it? Well, here's what Derek Carr said. He says, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to give my tithe, like I've always done since I was in college. That won't change. I'll still do that. Then I'll probably buy my wife something nice, even though she begs me not to. You see, she's frugal. She's a coupon user, and that won't change. None of that's going to change. And he looks, and he says, you know what the, the exciting thing about this for me, money-wise, honestly, is that this money is going to go to help a lot of people. I'm very thankful to have it, but it's in our, it's in our hands because it's going to help a lot of people, not only in this country, but in a lot of countries around the world. And that is what's most exciting about this for me. That's remarkable. That's a professional athlete, football player, in the world of the NFL, surrounded by a life of luxury, surrounded by people who are flaunting their wealth in, in radical ways that, that don't impress anybody. You know, the thing that's frustrating about this is that now... I'm going to feel conflicted when Derek Carr is on the field in an Oakland Raiders uniform. In December, he plays my Cowboys. It's remarkable. Gospel grace radically changes the way that we relate, that we relate to money and possessions. I don't know anything about Derek other than this interview and his amazing performance on the field, but from listening to it, it sounds like Derek gets this. He's not giving begrudgingly. Go watch the video. He's not saying, well, I mean, I, I guess I've got to give some to the church. I guess that I should give some to, to do other good things. No, he says, no, this is what I'm excited to. He says, I'm still going to eat. He jokes at the beginning. He's like, I'll probably splurge on, on some Chick-fil-A. I'll probably do that. Go nuts. Get two number twos. No, he's excited, joyful, giddy. Think of Scrooge. Joyfully thinking, I'm going to do a lot of good with this money. No. Giving does not become a major sacrifice, friends, when we realize that God owns all of our possessions, all of them. It's all his. He could take it away in a moment, ask Job, and he can give it all back. He can bless you. He can take it away. Our trust is in him, not on t holding so tightly 
to our stuff. More money, listen to this, more money, more stuff does not lead to more joy. More stuff doesn't lead to more joy. Young people, and I count myself among you, at least for one more year, (laughs) get this now. Teenagers in the room, those who are getting ready to go off to college, those who are working your first jobs, in your 20s, in your 30s, more stuff, more money does not lead to more joy. Get this now before you run this, as it's known as the rat race, appropriately so, trying to pursue, trying to pine after, trying to find joy that is never going to be found in stuff. Get that now. We want to be careful, though. There's a danger here, and it's been seen over and over again in the church. When, when, when we try to adopt this kind of generosity as an external work merely, God's not after your money. We're not after your money. Nobody, nobody is looking for you just to give more. God's after your heart. There are those who never seek Christ, who seek Christ, who is the power behind the generosity. They simply put it on. They give large gifts often when others will see them and often in thinking that somehow they will merit favor with God as a result. Oftentimes, we can justify our sinful lives by the amount that we put in the offering plate and that, that is not the heart that God desires. Read Micah. We don't give to earn God's favor, but as a result of already, having already received God's favor. We give because we've been freed from the slavery of greed and a life focused on building our own little kingdoms. We've been freed for life in God's eternal kingdom. We give because we see needs and gladly and gleefully give to advance God's kingdom, advance the work of the gospel rather than our kingdom. Has the grace of the gospel affected you like this? I want to ask you again, do you have a radically different perspective on money and possessions than the rest of the world? It's a a question to ask yourself to go home and think, what do I think about this? Where is my money going? Let me look at my bank account. Where have I been spending it? What do I think? What does that reveal to be my God? What what would I feel? Here's a question. If I went to (laughs) if I went to my next small group meeting and and somebody looked at my bank account, would would that cause them what would that cause me fear? Would I be embarrassed for others to see? Now, I'm, I'm not asking you to do this. No, nobody's going to ask you to see your bank account. But, but, it's, but it's a helpful exercise to think, what, what would be my response if somebody said, hey, can I look at your checkbook? Does that cause you fear? Or does that, do you think, yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, it's, it's not mine. And <laughs> I feel this too. Yesterday, we had this men's meeting. I spent way more time than anybody else. Uh, I, I took up all the time in the meeting almost, uh, just confessing my conviction from reading this passage and studying this passage this week and asking these men to pray for me, to be, to be a good steward, not to, and not just to be a good steward. Again, I don't want to slip into a workspace mentality. I don't want anybody here to walk out of here and think, okay, well, I should give more. Um, I I know I should do this. No, (laughs) I ask these guys to pray for me, to have a different heart, to have a different perspective on this. And not to just put it off, not to punt the ball to my wife who's better at managing the money than I am. Here's another question. Are you finding this an irritating sermon? (laughs) Is this too personal? All right. This leads to our final point. Lives changed by gospel grace result in gospel-driven mission. When we read this section, what stands out and affects us most is the radical generosity of this church. You cannot read this passage and not be affected by this, not come away thinking, wow, that is, that is countercultural. That's something else. That's otherworldly. That is supernatural. Well, that's what we're after. We are after supernatural grace. We're after supernatural change. We're after lives that look in such a way to demonstrate that this isn't just people being good people. It's not just people being nice people and doing good works. No, there's something else. There's another element at work in, in this place, and it's supernatural. We want people to come into our midst and say what? God is surely in this place. That's what we're after. So why, right in the middle of this section on their radical, generous giving, we have this verse in 33, 
With great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So he's talking about giving, and then he inserts a, 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 a sentence on evangelism. Luke includes this because the entire point of this whole book of Acts is the advance of the gospel through the church. So their unity, their generosity were not means in and of themselves, but they were means to an end. They adorn their witness. They, they contribute to the advance of the gospel. They live a compelling life as a compelling community to a compelling savior. Their lives like this make the gospel of Jesus Christ look attractive. When we see others living, living in unity and living generous lives, giving freely and joyfully, saying thank you. I mean, have you ever experienced somebody giving to you and then saying, hey, thanks for letting me do this. Thanks for the opportunity to give. What causes that? I mean, that makes you scratch your head and say, I want whatever that guy's got. And that's what happens when we're affected by gospel grace. Bible, commentary, uh, Bible commentator uh, Aji Fernando wrote a wonderful book on, on, the, on the gospel, on the, uh, on the book of Acts, and says the following. He says, community life is never an end in itself. A vibrant community is a community on mission. Maintenance of the group was not the primary consideration. Above all, this was a witnessing community, and for this reason, they enjoyed much grace from the Lord. You see, it's easy for a group to focus so much inwardly that evangelism loses its place of priority. But Luke guards against giving any impression that there was any period when the early church did not evangelize. In fact, this is impressive. Every chapter of the book of Acts, except chapter 27, says something about evangelism. Have you noticed that? This first church history textbook is essentially a history of evangelism. The gospel doesn't merely drive our mission. Rather, the advance of the gospel is our mission. We don't have personalized, individualized missions that God sends us on that are distinct from the, from the church, that are distinct from the community that God calls us to. Now, we have a common mission. If, if you are a Christian, Jesus calls you to submit to his lordship all of life. He calls for your heart, soul, mind, and strength, not just your bank, bank account, your entire life. We can't compartmentalize it and say, okay, well, I put a check in the basket, and therefore I've done my part. No, God wants all of it. He wants all of you, everything about you to submit to his lordship and to advance the gospel with your life, with every resource at your disposal. This means proclamation. This means unity in the church. Certainly, it means generosity. This means that we don't ask first, how much should I give, but how much should I keep? This means the one that we ask, the one that we call Lord, we ask him to direct both our path and to govern our wallet. This means discipleship. It means investing in one another's lives with our time. It means helping others to make gospel connections between this book, between the God of grace and their marriage and their parenting and their work life. Discipling one another, helping one another make gospel connections, asking, how does the gospel affect my growth as a Christian? How does the gospel affect my marriage, my parenting? What does the gospel say uh, for the way that I spend my time and my money? Talking, talking together about these things. We want to grow in these areas and disciple one another for the advance of the gospel in this world. This is our calling. Remember that our unity and our generosity are spirit-born characteristics of lives changed by the grace of the gospel. Our gospel proclamation require this. Our go gospel proclamation, void of lives, demonstrating the power of the spirit, is meaningless. It will bear no fruit but hypocrisy, whitewashed tombs, lives looking like the Pharisees. That's not what we're after. The Pharisees, they tithed of everything, right? They went around telling everybody that they did so. That's not what we're after. Our gospel-shaped unity, our gospel-shaped generosity, make the gospel of Jesus Christ beautiful. They help to advance the gospel because people see that our treasure is not on earth. Our treasure is in heaven. We have a perspective on our money and possessions that reflects that eternity is infinitely more valuable than buying that new toy. And I'm not against new toys. We're not against... Any, any of these things. There are good gifts in the world to be enjoyed. Vacations are good things. Boats are good things. A video game can be a good thing. Recreation, these are all good things, but they make terrible gods. 
What does your time, what does your stewardship of time and money reflect to be your God? We're not after unity for unity's sake or generosity for philanthropy's sake. This isn't corporate social responsibility, and we thank God. Uh, we thank God for, for those in the world, um, corporations and individuals who are wealthy, who have committed to giving half of their um, money and their possessions away to charity, away to alleviating suffering in the world. That's wonderful. We want to celebrate that. That's common grace. But our unity and our generosity serve a higher purpose. So we should work for earthly temporal relief because it's right and because it's a foretaste of the ultimate redemption that we have to come. It's an anticipation of the redemption that God is ultimately bringing about in this world. So we should always be seeking the ultimate good of those that God brings into our spheres of life. And that means gospel proclamation, joining Jesus in the advance of gospel in this world. The lives of these early believers lent great credibility to the gospel that they proclaimed. We want ours to as well. So I want to ask you again, is your view of money and possessions radically different than the rest of the world, or does it look just like your neighbors? Has the grace of the gospel affected you like those here in the early church? Do you love, not just, not just do you give, do you give in faith and in joy for the opportunity to do so, for the opportunity to serve others? Do you spend your time in a way that shows that you love God's people, that you care about others? Do you love to proclaim the gospel? Do you love to share the gospel with your neighbors? Lives affected by gospel grace result in gospel-driven priorities. Let's pray and ask God for help. Well, Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. I ask this morning that your word would be liberating to us. Not that we would walk out of here, Lord, with a to-do list. Not that we would feel condemned or guilty or compelled. But that we would be liberated. Thank you, God, for the good gift of conviction where it's needed. Father, we thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ. Your word says that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's what we're after, God. Free us, Father. So God, I pray that you would use your word to set us free from the love of stuff, but more importantly, God, that it would set us free from a love for ourselves. Father, would you use your word, your gospel grace, to give us gospel priorities. Grant us, Lord, gospel unity and gospel generosity. And Father, unleash us into gospel mission. We pray this for the sake of your glory in the magnificent, beautiful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.